I, like many of you, were excited about Cyberpunk 2077 for many years. That excitement could be traced back to 10 years ago at its very first trailer. That ended up becoming an ancient gaming myth like Half-Life 3 or Prey 2 or now GTA 6. But I'm mainly talking about the hype that was generated around E3 2018's Cyberpunk trailer. The trailer that I ended up watching 687,000 times. We were introduced to the wondrous Night City for the very first time along with V and a banging soundtrack. This game just looked too good to be true. Uh, and it was. <laughs> It especially looked too good to be true to be coming out two years from that announcement. Because the CD Projekt Red team, just less than two years prior, was finishing up their DLC for the beloved Witcher 3. Less than four years seemed like a pretty narrow time frame to generate such a giant, ambitious IP. But as we know now, with Cyberpunk's initial release, as they say, the bread fell on the buttered side. And got COVID. And delayed and refunded and lambasted for being an unoptimized, glitchy experience. And got a bunch of lawsuits against it. This bread sucked. What is this, Rye? I think Cyberpunk became the hype killer for a lot of us, mainly because CD Projekt Red had such a polished Polish track record, yet they still fell victim to over-promising and massively under-delivering. I played Cyberpunk day one when it was first released. I played the bread. If I'm being completely honest, I was a little bummed that it wasn't a third-person game. I know that there's valid arguments against why it can't be, but I did want the red team to make an ultra cyberpunk futuristic Grand Theft Auto, where I could see my crazy outfits and chromed out characters sliced through Night City. Not just be presented with two fully nude arms constantly exposed, where even if I have a suit on, for some reason he still rolls up his sleeves past his elbows but I digress. I played the game in its original state and it was a laughably glitchy experience. So much so that in just a few hours of gameplay, I ended up putting the game down for good. I feel like I could feel the frustration coming from the development team through the gameplay. And every time the game glitched out, it was an employee going, what, you can't possibly think I can get this all done in this amount of time, are you serious? Even after this massive blunder though, I still have a deep love and respect for the CD Projekt Red team, and I had a strong feeling that they wouldn't give up on the game. And they didn't. And thank God that they didn't, because Cyberpunk 2077 in 2023 is pretty freaking cool. Not immune to its problems, but man, it is some top tier gaming. I put over 100 hours into Cyberpunk 2.0, along with the Phantom Liberty DLC, and then of course after beating them, I looked up the alternate choices to make sure I wasn't missing out on any happy endings which are in short supply. <laughs> but before we go and talk about the future cyberpunk city, we gotta go back to the past like Samurai Jack and talk about World War II, because this video is sponsored by War Thunder. I was actually stoked when War Thunder reached out because this is a great game. It's crazy what this game is now. It's become the most comprehensive vehicle combat game there is today. It's got over 2,000 available planes, tanks, ships, helicopters, and more, going all the way back from the 1920s to modern day F-16. They even have my personal favorite plane in the game, the FJ-4B VMF-232 Fury Strike aircraft, classic plane. In War Thunder, you'll fly, drive, or boat your way onto the battlefield, where you'll experience intense PvP battles with different game modes with varying levels of immersion. Do you just want to rack up kills like this? Mm -hmm. That was an assist, but you get the point. Or do you prefer a more strategic approach? The graphics have been continually updated to keep up with the latest gen consoles and games. Oh baby, come on. With as good as the graphics are and the amount of vehicles that are in the game, War Thunder has become like the Forza Horizons of war. And War Thunder is available today for free on Xbox, PlayStation, PC, Mac, Penguin, just kidding, I know it's Linux. And if you use my link in the description, new players and returning players from over six months can claim a large bonus pack, which includes multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicle, and much more. And it's only available for a limited time. Thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring my video and supporting my channel. Now back to Night City. Night City might be my favorite urban city made in a video game. I might have a strong bias saying that because I'm coming right off of Starfield, which Night City blows the roof off of any Starfield city or barren outpost. Best open world city in a game aside. Fuck! <laughs> and you know how Starfield forces you into a loading screen every like 11 seconds? Driving around Night City, there is zero loading screens, and I never wanted to fast travel because I was so captivated by the city, especially with ray traced graphics, a beautiful day and night cycle, and a solid weather system. I drove through Night City for hours just drinking in this dark, wet, reflective dystopia. And that's not a joke. I would literally drive through Night City for hours on end with no direction in mind, which I love the driving in Cyberpunk. 
Cyberpunk 2.0. In Cyberpunk 1.0, it felt like I was driving a freaking car out of crackdown. It was so stiff and all the cars were super expensive. So you had this trash car for years on end. But now all the cars have like their own performances and some can really drift around. Some are super fast and can barely turn. But there's so many of them. You have so many different styles to try and you can find one that suits your needs. What you won't find is any customization whatsoever. I can't believe you can't even like choose your car color when you buy it. But on the bright side, you can get like James Bond guns in the front of your vehicle and freaking missiles on top of your car that actually are super effective. And one pro tip with vehicles in the game, you can press V to turn on and off your lights. Oh, that was a fucking bird. <laughs> I thought somebody was like screaming on the bridge. You can press V to turn your lights on and off in your car. No way. I thought the game was just bugged and my vehicle lights didn't turn on. But what's really cool is if you turn on your lights on a motorcycle, your wheels freaking glow up. And I played my entire first playthrough not knowing this. So if you don't see my wheels turned on for most of my motorcycle footage, that's why. You can hold toggle to turn on glowing rims on bikes. You're telling me this now? There's so much detail packed into Night City. From the different districts, to the cars you'll see, to the flying vehicles, to the styles and outfits, the architecture changes, different gangs show up. And the game provides you with a bunch of gigs scattered around town with a bunch of random fights breaking out. So you have plenty of reason to go explore and cause a ruckus around town. Even just walking around the town, I love seeing little events pop up like crime scenes, emergency vehicles landing to pick somebody up, walking down the street markets with a bunch of activities, seeing somebody playing guitar. There's plenty of buildings to walk into, a naked homeless guy can go attack you. You'll see gang members just beating up some poor soul on the street. It's wonderful. I will say kids still look weird as hell. Like you just took the transform tool and shift click and drag them down. Like you're making a Keanu Reeves a small meme. Look at this, these guys doing a drug deal with this little child. And there's a bunch of randomized outfits you'll see throughout town that look wild to say the least. And not in a wild future cyberpunky way, more in a way of like, what the hell is that guy smoking kind of way. Along with some bold looks are some really bold advertisements in the game. I don't know if it was just my playthrough, but I got the fucking eating ass ad 80% of my time in the game. What is this? I'm not judging, but I did see this ad over a thousand times. That's not exaggerating. Why is this the only sign I see? And there's actually a point I want to bring up about this. In my opinion, I'm not sure if the game's tone really warrants the amount of Saints Row raunchiness and attempts at GTA style satire. It's just not a funny enough game to have it litter the entire city everywhere you look. I'm not saying that there isn't room for funny ads. I just think the city's vibe could have been a lot cooler and fit more like a Blade Runner style if I wasn't seeing a mock cock ad every two seconds. Dude. What? I mean, I got to a point where I was considering modding my game so I could replace the advertisements with the ones that you see on Nexus. And that's the only reason why I would do that. I'm a man of principle. You're gonna see a lot of stuff that changes as you travel through Night City and the Badlands, but you know what else is gonna change? Your frames per second. This game chugs, and it chugs harder in some places more than others, but it is basically the new crisis benchmark for PC gaming. Overall, I managed roughly 75 frames a second. Some interior spaces broke 100 frames, and some outdoor city parts dropped below 45 frames a second. That was my performance with the main story. Before I got into the DLC where I was gonna be streaming it, I decided to do some Reddit research with my specs. People were playing with DLSS quality turned on, and even more importantly, DLSS frame generation activated. Basically, DLSS frame generation uses AI to put a frame in between the frames that your computer is actually getting to make it look like a more smooth experience. Of course I had DLSS quality turned on already. I don't live under a friggin' rock. But unknowingly, I didn't realize I had the option to turn on DLSS frame generation. Because in order to have it not grayed out, you have to turn on a setting inside your Windows settings, GPU, hardware, scheduling, calendar, acceleration, whatever it is. Restart your game, and if you have a 40 series graphics card, which do cost a lot of money, I'm sorry, you'll have DLSS frame generation available and you'll experience over a hundred frames of buttery, smooth, cyberpunk action, baby. I was immediately in love and bitter <laughs> that I experienced the whole game without this. <laughs> this is so funny. <laughs> this is so, I'm not angry. Look at that, 90 frames with ray tracing turned like all the way up. Very cool. Now, does that mean all of my gameplay, I mean 111 frames a second right now? No! No! <laughs> So in the end, before I started playing the DLC, I actually did keep frame generation turned on, but I turned down a bunch of my other settings and I put ray tracing to just ray trace reflections. All right, techno babble over. Now let's talk about how this game looks. 
Honestly, with or without ray tracing, the game still looks phenomenal. And coming off of Starfield, it's not even close. The lighting is unmatched, the textures look so good, especially when you're talking close to somebody. I mean, their eye movement alone is realistic. And one thing that has to be mentioned is the literal thousands of animations that are put into the game. It sounds so simple, but watching people perform simple actions like picking up objects in a room, leaning on a car, rolling in a chair, picking up a gun, makes the world so much more immersive. I'm sorry Starfield's catching so many strays in this video, but when I think about interacting with people in that game that was made in 2023, all I think about is people standing still with a blank half smile on their face talking to me with their head bobbing back and forth. In Cyberpunk, they move around, they take a drink, they lean, they can roll their eyes, they can touch you, they can love you, they can make love to you. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, of course there's still flaws with how good the game looks. There are still unfortunately some bugs and glitches in the game, but I can't emphasize this enough. There's way less than the initial launch, like 90% less is what I felt. But there is the occasional texture bug from weird lighting. She's your prodigy, Saul. Maybe it's a subsurface scattering? Let me... Hi, hi. <laughs> but it's hard to even mention because of how different it is from its initial launch. I also had a really funny coincidence bug. You know, through the game, you're dying from your bio ship in your head. And there's a part in one of the endings that's like five minutes away from the true ending of the game, where I got into this flying Delamain vehicle, and every time I would get into it, I would die immediately. And it was one of those moments where I'm like, maybe my time is up? <laughs> Seems like an abrupt ending to the game, but okay. But then I did like four more times and realized it was a bug, so I had to go look it up, and it turns out you have to press M repeatedly getting into the vehicle, and that'll cancel it out. I'm just happy I didn't run into truly ridiculous ridiculous bugs anymore, especially the ones surrounding cars and nothing like having my penis too show through my pants, which yes, was a real bug. So we've talked about how the game looks and runs, but now let's talk about how this game feels. Let's talk about the combat. What I love about Cyberpunk 2.0 is there's a bunch of reliably good ways to play the game. First, I was a sword swinging reflex samurai, cutting through enemies like a cake with my katana. I gotta mention, I love the gore in this game. I love seeing the mixture of blood and that weird white robo cream that comes out of robots in the movie Aliens. I just felt insane satisfaction blowing off chunks of Cyber Psycho's heads, especially after playing Rated E for Everyone Starfield where not even bullet wounds show up on the face. In Cyberpunk, you're cutting off people's limbs and decapitating people with your mantis arms like you're getting major pain because I'm I also built into the knife throwing tree, which paired with the awesome sound design, sounds like you're throwing blades at supersonic speeds. There is a few things that the game isn't great at explaining, like how your grenades and health items are now on cooldowns, which I love, but for the first quarter of the game, I thought they were still single uses like how it used to be. And in that same vein, I thought throwing knives, you have to go run and grab. No, they come back to you regardless if you go and pick them up after a few seconds. With that build, I also used some hard to pronounce cyberware called Sand Devastan, to me also known as Sand Vision, which is what I call it the entire game, which slows down time, but not yourself. So you can cut down multiple enemies in a sequence like your freaking Quicksilver in a kitchen. My next build was Netrunner, where I used quick hacks to simply kill people with my mind because my brain chi powers are absolutely devastating. This is actually the most OP build in the game right now, where you just use like stacks of Cyanus Burnout and a bunch of passives that make your quick hacks go to other enemies to defeat waves of enemies at a time. And I did like the idea of it, you know, just blowing up my enemies' brains without even raising their arms like some anime demon. It's awesome. But put into practice, I just couldn't find like a like a nice groove with it. So I eventually switched builds again. Oh, by the way, the way I'm trying different builds is uh, I did mod the game with one mod to get unlimited resets for my attributes and skills. I honestly don't know why Cyberpunk like locked this out as an option. I'm not saying it should be free. Maybe there's like an in-game currency fee that you pay every time you reset your attributes. But I think it's weird that CD Projekt Red expects people to play the entire story again just to try new builds. The last build I tried was something I like to call Space Cowboy. I thought this was gonna be the most bland build, but having the Deadeye effect mixed with the slow motion from Kernista Cross, Kernista Frog, Kernista Frog, that's what I said. That combination is gonna make you feel as badass as John Marston with the weaponry, a little bit more futury, of John Wick. I was all out power weapons. I'd freaking slow motion, dash to somebody with my shotgun, blast them, throw nades midair and dead eye them out of the sky. I'd see how many headshots I could pull off in a row in slow motion. This build became my favorite in the game for a smooth brain like me, ma'am. I was freaking Neo, man. Something I'd like to cover real quick is cyberware. Cyberware is basically your new armor. So no longer do you have to look like some strung out Barbie doll to have the best stats in the game. But I've talked to some people that have been playing cyberpunk lately and they don't seem to understand that cyberware is like crucial no matter what build you do. Some people think it's just for like net runners and stuff. Oh. 
I'll admit, I didn't really know what I was doing at first in this menu. It is a lot to take in. I just got the eyeball with the most amount of chords because I didn't want to read four paragraphs of the differences between these eyeballs that look virtually the same when I look at the descriptions. But you need to get things like getting the double jump for your legs and things like operating systems that allow you to slow down time are huge and you shouldn't miss out on them in your game. Do I know the differences between most cyber decks? No, but cyberware is important. Cyberware is also where you get your mantis arms, your mono wire, your gorilla hands, and your rocket arms, which all before the Relic DLC are pretty redundant. Am I wrong here? My katana was always faster and way more effective than my mantis blades, and my grenades were always way more powerful than my rocket arm. So why do we have these? Because it looks cool. Oh yeah, they're not terrible by the way. I just found me using them was only like a cosmetic choice. Oh, you're fucked. And if you do get the DLC, there is relic upgrades for them that do change their abilities a little bit, so it is much more fun to use them in Phantom Liberty. Speaking of cosmetics and cyberware, this was one area that I was let down by the team where you can't like Borg yourself out like Adam Smasher or that one salesman in Dogtown. You can only customize like your moist naked noodle arms and barely. Like they even give you like tattoo options, which are just a joke. They couldn't make three more tattoos for the game, but they could make 36,000 pieces of ridiculous clothing that you'll never see in the game unless you're riding a motorcycle. As far as combat goes, it is really strong for an open world RPG like this, but it still has its shortcomings. I was blown away that there's only like two stealth kills in the game. You can't sneak attack with the katana, mono wire, mantis blades, gorilla arms, or the knives. It's all done with your bare naked arms snapping necks like you're in an action 80s movie. And there is executions in the game, which is cool, but there's only like two per melee weapon. You take out thousands of enemies in the game, a ton of them in stealth, and there's so many unique animations in the game, but as far as combat goes, the game is severely lacking. On a more positive note, the game's sound design, when working properly, is pretty damn great. The tech sounds, the gun sounds, the car sounds especially, all sound phenomenal. I love the differences between like an electric car and a clearly more American muscle car. I will say this is a very sexy car. Cutting people up with your katana sounds absolutely brutal, like you're cutting into a piece of meat, which is what you're doing. But I will say some things, timing and volume levels do suck and make no sense. Cinematics where the sound completely misses the action, takes you right out of a scene. The music slaps so hard in the game, especially the combat music. But for some reason, once again, the music in clubs and concerts is at like 4% volume. Tell me, baby, do I look as fun as I feel right now? Like, why, why are the clubs so quiet? And Starfield suffer from this too. I'll say to a much worse degree, I don't think a developer at Bethesda has ever been inside of a real club. Trust me. I've been to a club because I like to party. No, but at least Cyberpunk's clubs look awesome and the concerts look so sick, especially that Cyber Psycho one I keep seeing shorts about. It's, it's preem, bro. God, I hate that I just said This is a narrative game with a lot of characters and a lot of dialogue a lot of dialogue. And I'll just preface what I'm about to say with, in general, video game stories and characters are a tough, tricky thing for me to buy into. A lot of things can go wrong. I'm saying this because I know a lot of people are gonna disagree with me on what I'm about to say. It's a rare occasion when I get invested into game characters more than surface level. But my favorite game ever is The Last of Us 1, primarily because I've never been so enthralled with a video game story. I didn't have to jump through hurdles of unrealistic dialogue, characters battling the uncanny valley. I didn't have to wait for awkward pauses or listen to somebody overshare so much exposition. All this being said, I liked Cyberpunk's story and characters. People like Goro are really cool, Victor's the man, and Pan Am I like a lot. I like a lot a lot. But I like these characters the most because most of the time they didn't feel like they were wasting my time. Unlike a lot of the other characters in Cyberpunk that fill this game with a ton of pontificating ideas and oversharing. You ever think about who you'd be now if, you know, life had taken a different turn? No, no, just probably a gamer. The game's in-game cinematics and story beats take their sweet ass time. Just as an example up front, the Mox Club scene where you meet Evelyn Parker for the first time, in my playthrough, which I had done before, that whole sequence took me 37 minutes. And that wasn't me learning how to brain dance or finding things in Evelyn's scene. I knew where everything was already, and it still took over half an hour. There's so many scenes where I'm locked in place and it goes longer than a freaking Metal Gear Solid cinematic. Which brings me to my next example. In the game, you play as Johnny for a little bit, and once that sequence ends, it takes almost 
30 full minutes for you to get back to playable V, minus a little car shooting with Takamura. It's just Takamura bringing you back to Victor, Misty giving you some pills, and being introduced to Johnny for the first time. And by no means am I saying it's the worst storytelling. It's, it's decent writing, but it just takes so much time. There's just so many examples I could point to where you're talking to a character for over 10 minutes. On top of that, the dialogue is usually talking about really angsty ideas, like who would you be if you made it out of this shithole city? Like, bitch, I literally have sword arms. Let me go cut people's heads off and not sit here listening to your teen girl squad problems. Ow, my skin! Don't do this often, I'm guessing. This meaning? Doing shit, just cause. No forethought. Carefree relaxing. Somebody you do get to spend a lot of time with is Keanu Reeves as Johnny Silverhand. And he really concerned me at first, coming off as this one note, pissed off, jerk in the band. Oh that hates anything with a logo on it or is remotely corporatized. He speaks about companies and Arasaka, like they went through a bitter divorce and Jeff Bezos now has his kids, which is probably the tone that they were going for. But he's such a notorious nice guy and in movies he usually plays like a quiet good guy protagonist, which is just in complete contrast with who Johnny Silverhand is where he's trash talking and swearing up a storm and Keanu Reeves sounds like he's just learning how to swear. The era fucking Saka, ratchet corpos, gonk junk fuckers, got it? They'd snort greed off their own c**ks if they took it up the ass. What does that even mean? There's just a lot of the time where I can picture Keanu Reeves delivering the lines in the booth, holding his headphones, reading off a sheet of paper in front of him in his blazer, reading extra slowly so they don't have to re-record. Hey, wasn't easy for me either. You woke up in a landfill, I woke up in your head. After a while, I feel like my ear just got trained to it, just to be like, that's how Johnny talks. He talks to you like he's alone, practicing what he's going to say to you later way back when you weren't even an itch in your daddy's ball sack. Hey, I saved your ass, got you out of harm's way, and you're still gonna doubt my intentions? And then I'm gonna be like, listen here, Choom. You got a lot of fucking balls thinking you got the biggest steel dick around here. You know, it's stupid. God, stupid. It goes to show how much of a skill good voice acting is when even like the giant movie stars have a difficult time pulling it off. All that being said, I did end up eventually loving Johnny. Yes, he comes off like such a dickhead at first. If I need your body, I'll fucking take it. But eventually you guys just start spending so much time together and start getting some like mutual respect for each other, even though he is a he kind of started becoming my partner rather than my adversary. That dynamic of the story was so interesting to me. Like, learning to trust Johnny the t Silverhand, it challenges your thinking. Like, do I just give the keys to my body over to this known t -t It's Keanu Reeves, so yeah, I did. Whatever you do with Johnny, just do not turn on his new alternate look. I don't know if somebody at the red team had it out for Keanu Reeves, but they turned him into a drunk shirtless greaseball. I I cannot tell you how much I dislike this look. Also, it is really crazy to see the enhancements in 2.0 when it comes to Johnny Silverhand. He looks so much better. I had to look at a lot of 1.0 footage for this video. He used to not have like eyelashes. Now he looks convincingly good and I loved interacting with him. But then we got the new kid in town, Idris motherfucking Elba. Yeah. This guy killed it. Idris plays the role as Reed in the new Phantom Liberty DLC. Idris translates from TV and movies to video games with almost no faults. He delivered his lines perfectly. It just shows what a freaking beast of a talent the dude is. And what's so awesome is his voice performance is paired with such an awesome model and all the animations that they put into the game. And he's not just a glitchy hologram like Johnny Silverhand, he's a real dude that you can like interact with in person and watch him pick up objects in a room. I just got to know Reed in such a believable way. So many mistakes. Idris, don't cry. Don't cry. Me and Idris Elba are basically best friends. The decision making aspect of Cyberpunk is where the game thrives. This game doesn't just let you pick three options and whatever you say in those ways is just gonna end up with the same conclusion. What you choose to say really matters and it will make you wanna reload the game a lot and not in a bad way, in a way of like, I wanna experience this in a different way to see what new outcome I can get. Did you forget something? A little respect. Here's another part where Cyberpunk's dialogue kind of slips for me. Have you guys ever chosen a dialogue option and V says completely the opposite of what you intended? <laughs> what? Great to see you again, Johnny. Curb the enthusiasm, kid. See, what was said right there, I actually am excited to see Johnny and I wish like he could hear my enthusiasm. But then it's like the delivery is like, great, 
now that you showed up, asshole. And this can hit critical moments. I had to reload my ending like six times just to get V to say what I wanted him to say. Decisions also play into your romantic life. I've criticized romance in a lot of video games because like, if I don't like the characters or they're not believable enough, why would I even try to pursue their flower? But in Cyberpunk, with the realistic models and their banter between friends is actually pretty solid, I really started to care. I loved Johnny, and I, like every man on the internet, was absolutely swooning for Pan Am, and I pushed the love envelope with her at any chance that I could. Got rejected plenty of times, which uh, I like that aspect of realism in the game that I can painfully relate to. I think it's best to rent rooms here. Oh, I knew there was gonna be a horny option. Play it cool though. <laughs> How about uh, we get some bunk beds? Good idea. What did you have in mind? Just uh, <clears throat> glad to have met you. There it is. That's my move. Good night. Mm-hmm. Hey, Pan Am. You ever think about the stars right now? I wouldn't mind catching a few winks. Yes, yes, please. Can you help? No. Fuck off. Mm-hmm. I couldn't ask for more. Woo! <laughs> what? Let's go, baby. Got a few ideas. Think you know what kind? Uh, no. What? It's really nice as is. Let's not spoil it, okay? You threw the legs up. Gonna bang Pan Am, huh? But when the time was finally right, we had that good old fashioned Metal Gear Solid 6. But I was surprised with Cyberpunk. When you're making love, you can't even see your chrome shaft. I'm sorry, didn't I choose to show genitals during cutscenes? I was under the impression they would show f Just showing f make a game rated A or something? What if both members' genitals are fully robotic? Can they show cyborg At the end of the day, it's just a piston with an intake valve. I don't know, just something I've been thinking about. <laughs> but now that I'm on the subject of I think that means that I'm running out of things to say about this game. The new DLC story is really well done. You're introduced to a character called Songbird who's very interesting, although she does the uh, angsty pontificating a lot, and I just... Just one more sec! Fuck, yes! Ugh, this world sucks! Shut up, Johnny Silverhand. Yeah, I'm a weapon of the corporations! But I was surprised with the amount of content put in the game. Not only do you have the main story mission, but there's like so many gigs that you can go on that are all custom and have these cool, funny, quirky stories that you can go on. Also, one of them features Susie the Sphere Hunter, my first YouTube friend, and she killed it in her role. She's part of one of like the best side quests. Congratulations, Susie. They definitely did not slack in bringing the heat with their new expansion and just reviving their game to a 2.0 version. I had a lot of fun with Cyberpunk 2.0 and Fan Liberty DLC, Idris, Call Me, and a large portion of my faith in CD Projekt Red has been restored. Good job, team, and good luck with The Witcher 4. And thanks to you guys for watching my video. Catch you in the next one, bitches. Uh, sorry. <laughs>